Back in 1958, when my dad would be about 16 years old, as a junior in high school, he would play basketball in this same gymnasium before my grandparents would move the family from Montpelier, Idaho to Mesa, Arizona. I'm certain my grandparents sat in these stands cheering all of their sons on at different times. But today, our youngest son Reed and his teammates are playing for the championship in the same gymnasium. Okay, this week's video is brought to you by Nuts.com. If you're not familiar with Nuts.com, you need to get familiar with Nuts.com because Nuts.com offers everything from dried and roasted nuts to dried fruits to pantry staples to over 50 different types of trail mix. And the quality is second to none. Last month when my order showed up, I ordered uh, dehydrated mangoes. I eat a lot of those dried mangoes. I don't feel guilty eating these kinds of snacks. And not only that, they keep me going, and so I'm able to continue to work. So everything from dried apricots, bourbon, pecan, these things right now are my favorite, to specialty flowers for the pantry. A family-owned business that has been around since 1929, now third generation owned and operated. Again, this is the kind of company I wanna support. Their products are amazing, they're always amazing. Instead of ordering the same products that I ordered last month, I let them send me a few different variety packs and it took everything in me not to eat every bit of this up before I was scheduled to do the ad. This happened last month, by the way, as well. By the time Cedar and I recorded the ad for nuts.com, I had eaten everything they'd sent us. They roast their nuts and their popcorn the same day that it shipped. So it reaches you deliciously fresh and satisfaction is guaranteed. So right now, nuts.com is offering new customers a free gift with purchase and free shipping on orders of $29 or more at nuts.com slash redpoppyranch. Thank you, nuts.com. I will be eagerly waiting my next order to show up. That's for sure. Before I roll the 1990 F250 frame with the 7.3 IDI and the ZF5 transmission in it, before I roll that back in the shop, I went over this thing, not only with the pressure washer, but because I plumbed the outside hose bibs with hot water. I'm using the hot water to get everything as clean as I possibly can before I go over the frame with the POR15. Then after it's painted and the frame dries, I can start the reassembly process for the final time. Because I ran hot water through that pressure washer, it really made a huge difference, especially because it's about 32 degrees outside. Thank you. 
Before I put the cab and the front clip back on this truck, there's a few things I want to take care of. Mainly the fuel system, the glow plugs, and the electrical harness. That is one of the old glow plugs that was a little bit swollen but still came out without too much effort. If I really want this truck to start and run on those below zero winter days without too much effort, it starts with good quality Motorcraft ZD9 glow plugs. And then every potential leak in the fuel system has to be eliminated for this truck to start on those days. So after I got all of the old glow plugs removed and replaced, I replaced all of the injector caps, the O-rings, and all of the fuel lines and the hose clamps in between the injectors. Okay, let me go over a couple things real quick on this old truck. I turned the camera off for a bit, but I uh, installed the rear Super Duty shock towers instead of having the opposing shock towers that are normally on these 90s Fords. I even installed the uh, e-brake so the emergency brake with that Super Duty rear, rear axle will work perfectly with uh, the 1990 uh, e-brake and I guess ultimately I'm going to end up using the e-brake from the 1969 truck so I'm going to have to figure that out but but having that bracket in, welded in there like uh, came on the 2000 frame, I, I basically copied the, the 2000 uh, Super Duty frame that I took these axles out from under. I even went as far as installing the brackets for the um, sway bar. So now the sway bar uh, will work properly. Um, the only other thing that I haven't done with this front axle that I'm tempted to do the Super Duties would originally have had a pan hard bar. Um, I don't know if I have room with that steering box to make, make the uh, pan hard bar work. And it's probably a little overkill because there isn't much of a lift on this truck. But all of the injector caps and return lines were replaced. I mean, everything's literally ready to go now. All I've got to do is the, the POR 15 uh, in and out of the frame, let it dry, and then start the reassembly process. Cedar and the kids are gone for the week, so I'm trying to do two things this week. I'm trying to get the cab back on this frame, and then I'm also trying to get all of the drywall and the paint done, and yet even get it painted. So I've got my hands full with the, uh, the drywall and the paint, but I'm starting to get excited again about this truck. This truck's going to end up being a really sweet truck. To have a 1990 F-250 frame with a ZF5 uh, manual transmission in that 7.3 IDI uh, with the Super Duty axle. So now it has all um, disc brakes all the way around. And then the suspension is the big thing. That's, that's the, the biggest issue with these old trucks is the short leaf springs that just rattle your teeth. And now with the Super Duty leaf springs, uh, this truck should really ride like a, 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 a dream. I, I'm already making some changes in my head for the next one that's probably going to have a 12 valve cummins and maybe a nv5600 and maybe that'll be my daily driver but i need I, I gotta get this one done and after pressure washing this thing the way that i did it's never been so clean so now the por 15 and then we're going to start the reassembly process The guy that I got the truck from said I had a power steering issue. So far I've found two power steering leaks that covered the entire underside of the engine and when I pressure washed everything it actually cleaned up really really well. So I'm going to do hydro boost brakes on this truck so I'm going to have to figure that out when I get to that point. Uh, but really the hard stuff's done and this should start going back together pretty quick. My goal for next week actually, depending on how quick I can get the injection pump sent out to uh, area diesel services, they've been waiting on me for like two months now. So I've got to pull that injection pump, send it out to them real quick. And then it's going to come down to uh, getting this thing put back together. And I'm, 
I'm getting real excited about that. Just in time for some good weather. When we first started our YouTube channel, I thought it was in the best interest of myself and my wife and my kids if I kept our personal information to a minimum. So up to this point, I've never said my last name on any of our YouTube videos. Matter of fact, most of you guys don't even know what my first name is. My last name is Skinner, and Skinners are from Bear Lake, Idaho, but more specifically, we're from the Nounan Valley. After our youngest son, Reed, and his teammates won the championship for their age over there in Bear Lake, a nice elderly woman approached my wife, Cedar, and she asked about his last name on his jersey, Skinner. She said, are you Bear Lake Skinners? My wife said, yes. She said, are you Noun and Valley Skinners? My wife said, yes, again. Then this nice elderly woman said, any relation to Charles? And my wife, Cedar, said, that's Reed's grandpa. And this nice woman said, he was my boyfriend in high school up until they moved to Arizona. Now that nice elderly woman would be in her early 80s, which would be the same age that my dad would be if he was still alive. But ironically enough, that woman would marry into a family who would later on buy all of my family ranch land from my grandpa, and now to this day, her kids farm the land that had been in my family since about 1870. You know, they always say you don't want to be the one that has to sell the farm, but my grandpa sold the farm in the early 90s after my grandmother had passed away, and he'd gotten old enough that he was no longer interested in trying to be a farmer. But I take a lot of pride in the legacy and the people that came from that ranch.
By the way, before selling the farm and the ranch, my grandpa offered it to my dad and his brothers, and none of them wanted it. Okay, so for the last couple of hours, I have been working on the fuel system, the electrical, basically everything that needed to go on the inside of the frame. And now that the paint's all dried, um, I wanted to get everything looking as good as it could for the final time. Uh, but the fuel system is always the main issue uh, with, with the 7.3 IDIs, the 6.9s, all of them, all the way up to the power strokes. Uh, they all have fuel issues. Um, so by, by getting rid of the saddle tank, by eliminating the bypass valve that sits there, I think the bypass valve sits up here, by eliminating all of that stuff, I take it from basically two connections at the fuel tank to two connections up here at the, the lift pump and one connection on the back of the motor with this return line. So all of the fuel issues go away because there's way less places for it to pull air from. So, so I got all of the fuel lines laid out, all of the electrical laid out. I think I'm basically ready to set the cab in place. Um, for what should be the final time. There's a little bit more uh, electrical stuff. I need to get some clips to hold the loom um, to the frame rail, but it turned out really nice and that's what I wanted it to do. I'm gonna paint the leaf springs and the axles with a different paint. I don't typically use POR15 on the leaf springs because POR15 can be a little bit brittle. And the truth is, this even this frame is going to get some uh, buildup and some dirt on it fairly quickly. So I, I really don't care that much. But but to have this thing stripped down as far as I did and to not take the time to, to paint the frame would have been a mistake. So uh, this truck's going to get used. This truck's going to get driven. And for that reason... Uh, I'm not horribly concerned about the axles and the, the suspension, but I'm going to go over it probably with the same stuff that I used on the firewall uh, before I make this thing uh, an official driver. But let me go over everything and show you what I've, what I've taken care of. Okay, we've got the fuel. This is the main line going to the lift pump. This is the return line. I had to modify the Ford clips to get the bigger lines to fit in there. And I did have one, uh, one seam there where I just didn't have quite enough 3 8 fuel line. And so I put extra hose clamps on that. But the fuel system on this truck, I shouldn't have any issues with. Uh, between that uh, single tank and between just the, the whole new um, the fuel lines, this thing really should fire right up and it, and it really should fire up on those cold days and that's kind of what I'm aiming for. So, so the, I ran the fuel line under the motor and ran it along the frame rail with both the return line and the brake line. All right, so this is the e-brake setup with this rear Super Duty axle. This is how I made it work on this uh, 1990 frame. So from this point with the e-brakes, I'll be able to use all of the stock um, fittings and everything once I get the cab in place. So I think we got it. I was trying to keep it very, very simple and very clean. I didn't have, I don't have anything on that side other than, than the exhaust. I'm getting excited about this thing. I really am. I can see a, uh, a light at the end of the tunnel finally. So it's not gonna take much to get this thing on the road from here. Cab goes on next. I'm gonna get that cab precision lined up. I'm gonna keep the bed off to finish the drive lines, finish the brakes. I've got some parts coming for the front brakes. I still have to do the hubs to get everything eight on six and a half, but that won't take much. And the other thing is I'm gonna convert this over to HydroBoost brakes instead of the uh, the booster that it had, the style that it had on here. So, but that's all stuff that I can do after the fact. So, if I didn't have so much rust repair on that cab, and all I had to figure out was just sitting, getting that cab sitting up against this motor. This truck would have been done by now, I'm guessing. 
And the other part of rust repair that, that, uh, that, at least for me, is so difficult is it just slows everything down. So the momentum of the project comes to a screeching halt, again, for me, when I have to deal with uh, rust like that. So if the cab and the body and everything had been as clean as uh, would have been ideal, then this truck would have been on the road by now. But either way, once I get, uh, once I get the cab on this frame, I'm going to... I'm gonna get fired up to get this thing on the road. Then the big question becomes, do I keep the truck bed or do I build a, uh, a wicked awesome flatbed for it? Growing up in the small circles that was Mesa, Arizona back in the 70s and the 80s, even into the 90s, I would be asked about my last name in relation to my dad and my grandfather. My dad had been a school teacher at the local high school for nearly 40 years, and my grandfather also taught at that same high school. And so when I would be asked about my last name, it really didn't go back to Idaho. So when that nice elderly woman specifically asked about my dad, it made my heart warm, especially thinking that my son just beat her grandson. Playing the game of basketball that my dad loved so much in the gymnasium that was one of the last places he played before moving to Arizona. Now, as a young man in my teenage years, I struggled with my last name and how I identified with it. But I can tell you now as a middle-aged man, my last name and the legacy that came with it has been one of the consistent anchors in my life that has directly affected the path that I would end up on and how I relate to these people that came before me. So the legacy that my family name would have in Idaho goes back to about 1858 when my great-great-grandfather John Skinner would travel with his wife from northern England to New York City and then over the next 10 years would bounce around until he would end up in Bear Lake, Idaho, specifically the Nounan Valley. Now my great-great-grandparents through the Homestead Act would end up with somewhere around 1,200 acres. They would eventually sell the farm to their youngest son, my great-grandfather, who would eventually sell the farm to his youngest son, my grandfather. So my great-great-grandfather in his 50s would get on a boat and leave the country of his birth behind as well as a whole lot of family, ultimately in pursuit of freedom. When Cedar and I chose to move our family 800 miles from the Metro Phoenix area to southeastern Idaho, we specifically did not choose Bear Lake.
We chose to move to a little town on the other side of the mountain from Bear Lake, which happens to be part of what's called the Cache Valley. Now, Cache Valley is often associated with Utah, but technically there's part of Idaho in there too. So again, it's kind of fun to go over to the family stomping grounds and watch my son and his teammates do work and bring home the gold. Oh yeah, we Skinners have a tendency to be a little competitive. That nice elderly woman that was my dad's girlfriend up until he moved to Mesa, Arizona, her son was one of the coaches that played against my son and his teammates. And that team might have been a little bit more aggressive than Reed and his teammates were used to, but they still got the job done and managed to get that team beat. Now, if you go back through some of our early videos, I believe it was in either the first or second year, I went over to the family ranch with one of my kids and we made a couple of videos. But in one of the videos, I showed a little tiny pioneer cabin out on the hill that was thought to be my great-great-grandparents' cabin when they very first settled in the Nounan Valley in 1868. Now, nobody is alive that can officially confirm that that cabin is in fact the homestead cabin, but it makes sense. It's on the family land. And at some point, hopefully soon, I'm going to rebuild that cabin over here on our property. And then we're going to make it available to people like you that might want to come and hang out for a minute. So next Tuesday, I believe it's next Tuesday, it's supposed to be 65 degrees. 65 degrees. Cedar called me from Arizona this morning and she said it was cold. I asked her how cold. She said 55. I told her our low last night was 24. I just had the thought that I need to probably go give the deer um, a bale of hay a little bit early. I wouldn't normally give it to them until tomorrow morning, but with this storm, I've been kind of watching them out there. And I could tell that uh, they basically ate all of their food a little bit faster than they normally would. And now they're all standing around and a bunch of those does are making babies. So I need to probably work hard to keep the, the hay in front of them. Man, it is coming down.
So this room will get one more sanding, but you are not gonna see any more drywall on video about the shop anytime soon. On next week's video, all of these rooms will be cleaned up and painted, and I will be working on that shower in combination with something outside because it's supposed to get warm next week. We wanted to say thank you for taking time to see what we're doing. Cedar and I have talked about doing this for a number of years now, but we have finally decided to open up a couple of real simple campgrounds where you might be able to come and hang out for a couple of days and maybe even work right alongside of us. The first two campgrounds should be pretty simple, but the third one, I'm thinking about building that old pioneer cabin from our family land. In the meantime, again, thanks for stopping by and seeing what we're up to. Without your guys' support, this whole thing doesn't really work. Thanks again. We'll see you in a week.